Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be introducing to you guys what uh, Apache Apollo is. It's hopefully going to become the next generation of uh, the ActiveMQ project. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, been, uh, well, I'm a Red Hat engineer. Uh, I've been working on an open source for lots and lots of years, like probably like 10 years now. I'm a committer on ActiveMQ, uh, Camel, Carafe. Geronimo, service mix, so generally lots of messaging and integration type related projects. Uh, I'm an Apache member and the current PMC chair for ActiveMQ. Um, and I've also founded or co-founded lots of little other side uh, open source projects like Hot Dispatch and uh, 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 JNI binding for, for LevelDB, uh, projects like JNC and lots of other ones. <coughs> so. Uh, today, I just want to kind of introduce what Apache Apollo is to you guys uh, and try to dive in a little deeper and, and basically compare it to how it's different from uh, Apache ActiveMQ, which it's very similar to, and then cover a little bit about uh, where it's going, uh, what's going to be coming up, what, what's in the latest release, which uh, release just was done yesterday. So uh, Apollo 1.6 is hot off the presses. Um, <coughs> Okay, so without further ado, um, so what's Apache Apollo? Uh, it's a messaging server, very similar like ActiveMQ. It's a messaging server, or some folks call it a messaging broker. Uh, it supports uh, queue semantics, topic semantics. Uh, it does transactions, so you can do, uh, a, do a, a group of messaging operations and put it all under transactions, so either they all occur or you roll back and none of them occurred. Uh, it also does reliable messaging. You can send it a message, and once the broker tells you, yeah, I got it, you're pretty much guaranteed you're not going to lose the message, which is uh, important for, for lots of folks. <clears throat> All right, so who here's uh, done messaging before and has an idea of what? Okay, good. Still lots of you didn't raise your hand. So I'm just going to cover the basics just for 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 the sake of covering, so you guys get an idea what kind of messaging I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, instant messaging or any of that stuff. Uh, so this is enterprise messaging, and uh, there's basically two main models people think about when they think about uh, message-oriented middleware or enterprise messaging. And the first one is uh, the point-to-point -point model, which uses queues, okay? So let's say you have an application uh, which needs to communicate with another application. Uh, they could be, it could be, for example, uh, a, uh, a storefront needs to communicate with uh, a warehouse to find out what the inventory is or something like that, or, or basically needs to let it know that, hey, somebody just bought something, so later on you need to ship me another one of these widgets because uh, you know, my, my shelf has you know, reduced one of these. So basically that application is going to produce a message and send it to a queue, and uh, the idea is now there's a messaging system that's going to hold on to that message. It's going to reliably hold on to it. You don't have to worry. Once the CUNY system accepts it, uh, that application no longer has to worry about uh, the status of the network, or if it's down or up. You could be communicating, the store could be communicating over satellite links or something very unreliable like that. The queuing system or the messaging system will take care of healing uh, the status and retransmitting messages if it needs to, so that eventually those messages get to the consumers, which could be some warehouse applications keeping track of the inventory, right? So on a queue, you can have multiple consumers, right? Uh, and the idea is that only, a message will only be received by one consumer at a time. So he'll deliver it, those messages to different consumers, and only one consumer will get to one copy of the message, so that it only gets processed once. So in a way, this is kind of like uh, HTTP requests. They kind of go, uh, you can have a load balancer in front. The load balancer will distribute the work across uh, the available servers. <coughs> so the other pattern that's very common is the publish subscribe pattern. And that goes over a concept called topics. So you send to destination, topic destinations. And when those messages are sent by the producer, uh, the topic will replicate that same message to all the currently connected consumers, or, or also sometimes called subscribers. Um, if a consumer's not currently connected, like in this case, he's going to miss that message. And, but if he does connect later on, he'll get subsequent uh, publications to the topic. 
Now there's also some hybrid models. You can actually attach things called durable subscriptions to these uh, topics. So that way, even if your client application is not online at the time, the durable subscription will queue up all the messages that were sent to the topic. So in a way, a durable subscription is like attaching a queue to a topic. OK, so in a way, Apollo is very much the same thing that ActiveMQ is today. It provides almost all the same features. Uh, it has a few less right now. We basically are, have implemented Apollo as a way to address some of the scalability issues with ActiveMQ. Um, but we're not yet trying to replace it, okay? Once Apollo does implement every single feature ActiveMQ has, and basically we're happy with it, we'll call this thing the next major revision of ActiveMQ. It could be, might be ActiveMQ 6 for all I know, right? But if you're using ActiveMQ today, we're not saying you switch to Apollo. ActiveMQ is a very solid, mature product. It's been tested forever. Uh, it's like six or seven years old or something like that. Um, and it's going to be supported for a long time to come. So I'm not saying uh, switch from, uh, to Apollo from ActiveMQ or something like that. Um, so uh, Apollo is kind of like leading edge. It's, it's kind of breaking ground for ActiveMQ. It's going to be the next generation. Uh, the nice thing is there's already lots of features that we developed in Apollo that we've been backporting back into ActiveMQ5. Uh, for example, ActiveMQ 5.8 now has um, the level DB store that we uh, implemented in Apollo, provides much better performance, uh, persistence performance, and uh, things like that. So, so who here is using, has used or is using ActiveMQ? Okay, good. Yeah, totally don't want to scare you guys off from using ActiveMQ, but <coughs> you might want to tr start trying out Apollo. Okay, and, and the main reasons you want to do this is if you got a lot of ActiveMQs deployed because uh, basically uh, uh, a single broker instance isn't in scaling as far as you want it to, Apollo might have, you might be able to put more load on a single Apollo server. It has lower CPU overheads. It's got a reduced memory footprint due to its threading model. Uh, and it supports some nice things like uh, runtime configuration reloading. In ActiveMQ, typically, if you modify its configuration, you kind of have to restart the broker for it to reload uh, its settings. With Apollo, it can detect changes in configuration. And uh, it won't even disconnect clients or anything like that. It'll just apply the changes as needed. Okay? It's also got a really nice REST management API, which provides uh, more detail than what the current GMX management API that uh, ActiveMQ has. Oh, and, and another kind of uh, architectural kind of driving factor here that we've been tr I've been trying to do with Apollo is uh, keep the configuration as simple as possible. With ActiveMQ, uh, it's, it's grown over many years. Uh, it's supported some changes. For example, it started as a traditional uh, blocking server using blocking I.O. Then we added an I.O. support to it. Uh, and we've kind of just taken a kitchen sink approach to features and options that you can basically configure in the broker. Some of which, if you configure too many options, they can, uh, they can conflict with each other, let's say. Uh, with Apollo, we're trying to keep the, the number of configuration options as small as possible, do as much auto-tuning as we can so we can take the magic out of, okay, how do I tune this to get good performance? Apollo will self-monitor and try to apply tuning options itself so that way end users don't have to do it. <clears throat> this is a big picture of uh, the parts of an Apollo broker. Uh, it all sits on top of, new, of a new threading model, which I'm going to dive into more detail in a few slides, uh, which is called Hot Dispatch. It's a library, it's a standalone library you can use for your own projects. Um, but then it also has lots of pluggable uh, parts into it. It's got uh, different stores uh, that you can plug in, one's a level DB and, and one's a BDB, and then lots of protocols and then lots of transports. And I'm going to drill into each one of these in a little more detail. So, the first thing a broker has to do 
is accept connections from clients so they can send and receive messages. And um, the protocol that it accepts a connection over is going to be t typically uh, TCP or SSL. That's what most messaging systems use today. Uh, but in addition to that, we also support web sockets and secure web sockets. And we also have a UDP transport, which is basically just used to receive messages over. So if you want to do uh, quick, uh, you know, messages might really drop, but I'm going to send a lot of them like syslog or something like that. You can, uh, it also supports UDP to receive messages. <coughs> um, so each one of those transports will, if you have each one enabled, so you could pretty much have five transports enabled in a Apollo broker and each one's gonna use up a single port. Or you might just have one, like for example, it's just TCP, it's gonna be one port, but over this one port, it can support multiple protocols. Basically, um, when the, a protocol first connects, uh, we're gonna do a protocol discrimination. We're gonna look at the magic bits in front and we'll say, oh, you're, you're an MQTT connection, so we'll handle you like an MQTT T connection, which is quite different from how Active and Q5 does it. Basically, every protocol has to open up its own port, uh, which some folks don't like their servers having tons of ports open, which, you know, some people just don't like it. So, with the protocols that we support in Apollo today are pretty much the same ones that uh, Active and Q5 supports now. So, it's Stomp versions 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, MQTTV. 3.1, uh, NQP 1.0, just recently added that, and OpenWire, which is the protocol that native ActiveMQ JMS clients talk. <coughs> um, so STOP was the first protocol that we ever implemented with Apollo. We started with STOP because it was a really simple text-oriented protocol to implement. It's simple to inspect on the wire what's going on. You can look at a TCP dump and really follow it, understand what's going on, see what, what, what went wrong. And uh, it's so simple that uh, it's got a huge number of uh, language uh, clients, native language clients, like this Ruby and Stomp and PHP and just about anything. And if you're on a platform or in a language that the existing client doesn't exist or you guys don't like the way it was implemented, it's such a simple protocol like HTTP. It's very similar if you look at the frames it's basically using HTTP-like framing. Um, you can implement it in a couple hours, probably. Um, the nice thing is that it's, it's become a really popular standard. Uh, other messaging brokers have implemented it, not only ActiveMQ, but HornetQ and RabbitMQ have implemented it. So, Another really popular, well, I want to say it's hugely popular, but I think it's an upcoming protocol that's kind of very interesting is uh, a protocol called MQTT. And it's uh, basically focused on just uh, a publish describe over topics. That's the only thing it can do. So that's one of the limiting factors of MQTT. It can only use, be used on topics. Uh, but for some folks, that's good enough. It's uh, focused on uh, small devices and it's probably got the smallest per message uh, frame overhead of all the protocols. To send a message, I think the, the overhead in addition to the body on MQTT, I think it's like a three, two or three byte overhead on every message. It's like ridiculously low. While every other protocol, like including Stop or OpenWire or even ANQP, adds uh, a ton of headers and ton of framing information, and QTT keeps it super low. So it's basically for low bandwidth networks, right? Uh, or in cases like, uh, for example, I know that uh, I think Facebook adopted it for their uh, mobile platforms. It's just because they have so many of the connections. Uh, even though they're on high bandwidth networks, they got so many of them. Once you add it all together, it starts adding up. So MQTT is good for that. Uh, and uh, we've implemented it. It's a pretty simple protocol to implement. And uh, the folks who's, uh, who've added support for it are WestVMQ, Mosquito, I think uh, Rabbit and Q have recently had support for it. And of course, if you guys made any of the earlier NQP sessions, we've added NQP 1.0 support. Uh, thanks to a little library in the Cupid project called uh, Proton, a sub-project of, of uh, Cupid. 
Uh, it's a library that makes it super simple to implement uh, NQP 1.0 support as a broker, as a client. Uh, it handles all the binary encoding and decoding and all the pr uh, protocol state management for you. So it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a very efficient binary protocol. It supports queues, topics, transactions. So it basically does everything that a traditional messaging mom needs. So it's not limited in the way that MQTT is. It's more tightly encoded on the wire, more tightly encoded than Stomp is. Uh, but uh, if you ever look at the only downside to MQTT is if you look at the protocol traces of it, you might not be able to understand what's going on. So that's the only downside to it. You'd really have to be uh, uh, have read the MQP spec to really understand it well. <coughs> uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and it op interoperates with ActiveMQ5. Uh, that's also had MQP 1.0 support added since version 5.8. Uh, Qubit, of course, and SwiftMQ. Okay. The last protocol I want to tell you guys we support is OpenWire. This is a biggie for, for Apollo if we ever want to become the replacement for ActiveMQ5 uh, because that's the protocol. It natively talks. It's uh, JMS clients implement OpenWire. Uh, and uh, also, we have implementations of OpenWire in .NET and C++. So lots of the users of ActiveMQ use OpenWire when they're talking to ActiveMQ. Uh, the only one part of OpenWire we haven't implemented on Apollo is XA support, but we have support for just about everything else, including things like message groups, uh, exclusive consumers, and like just about all the other details. So Apollo's got it all in the bag. <clears throat> uh, okay. So message stores. So there's an important part of every broker, reliable messaging broker, is that it needs to be able to persistently store the messages it receives so that in case if there's a power outage or for whatever reasons it gets killed, uh, it needs to be able to restart, recover, and reload all those messages that had not been delivered, that had received but had not delivered to its consumers, right? So um, there's basically two options that we have in Apollo. It's pluggable. Um, we could probably add more in the future. Like for example, ActiveMQ has many, many more. It has like four options that it ships with. One of them is to talk to like a JDBC database to store its uh, options in. And we may add things like that in the future. But the ones that we do have included is uh, one that's uh, level DB based and one that's BDB based. Um, and another difference here from ActiveMQ is we use these message stores not only to store the persistent messages, but we'll use it to store the non-persistent messages. In uh, ActiveMQ, non-persistent messages would actually be stored uh, slightly different from regular persistent messages. <coughs> okay, so the level DB store implementation is very similar to uh, the store implementations we've done in, in ActiveMQ before. They use a journal plus index approach. The indexes are being implemented on top of level DB. In ActiveMQ, uh, our implementations you tended to use indexes that were implemented using B trees, but we found out that uh, level DB indexes actually work much better for messaging because we tend to insert uh, into the indexes in an incrementing fashion. It's not like a random write into the index. We tend to insert into the end of the index almost all the time since we have incrementing uh, message numbers. And uh, we also tend to read them in a sequential fashion too. We don't tend to do random lookups through, through, uh, through the index. And those uh, usage patterns actually work really well with LevelDB. Um, since LevelDB is ASL based, it's a pure ASL option. That's why it's the default implementation that we uh, ship with with uh, Apollo. We set up an Apollo broker by default. It's gonna use the LevelDB store. Uh, the default implementation we ship with uses a JNI binding to the uh, level DB C code that was uh, created by Google, right? Uh, level DB indexes are, it's a Google project they open sourced. Um, so since it's a JNI option, it's not super cross-platform. It's only, we are only gonna, we have pre-compiled and we ship with the pre-compiled binaries for OS X, Linux, and Windows on 32-bit and 64-bit. But if you're, if you're not using that, you might be out of luck. You, uh, but we also have include a pure Java implementation that we automatically switch to if the JNI one is not uh, used. The only downside to this is this pure Java one 
it's not tested as much. So your, your mileage may vary, uh, which is why we still have support for the BDB store implementation. This was the first store implementation we did for Apollo. Uh, the downside to it, it's not ASL based, right? You have to go and download the BDB library jar from Oracle and add it to your, to your Apollo installation. Um, the nice thing about this, it's, it's pure Java, so it's gonna run on any platform, AI, Solaris, whatever, something weird like that. Uh, and, uh, but, but it's also very robust, so that's, uh, you know, BDB's been battle tested. <coughs> All right. So I've kind of been diving a little bit into what makes Apollo different, but now we're really gonna look into some of the things that make Apollo really different from ActiveMQ. And uh, I'm gonna start diving in a bit deeper. Um, but you know, the devil's in the details and all this stuff, you know. At the end of the day, Apollo pretty much, to an end user, it's gonna do the same thing that ActiveMQ. But the question is, why, why is it doing it better? Why is it uh, more efficient? Uh, you know, and here's where I'm gonna kind of try to dive into the why. Okay, so number one. ActiveMQ, uh, traditional ActiveMQ, it, you know, was started many years ago before there was even an I.O., right? So it uh, had, AP everything was blocking-based APIs, threads could block everywhere. So once you guys start running a system with, you know, thousands of threads on it, I mean, thousands of connections against it and thousands of, of destinations, you're gonna, if you start monitoring that system, you'll notice that, you know, it's got thousands and thousands of threads running in it. And um, I don't know, for most folks, once you get a JVM that's got thousands and thousands of threads running on it, you'll notice that it's, uh, it, it's tricky to tune that JVM to perform nicely. <clears throat> so in Apollo, we basically uh, started thinking, okay, let's try to handle this. Let's try to use NIO uh, and uh, let's go with uh, a basically a, a multi-threaded reactor model, right? So you can think of this as being, for, for you Node.js guys, you can think of this as being uh, a Node.js event thread per core running in a single process. Whereas a Node.js event thread is usually single threaded. There's only one. Here we're gonna have run one per core in a single process. And they can kind of sort of talk to each other a little bit, each, each core, if, you know, we, we added some of this in there. All right, another way to think about it is um, we're gonna use a fixed size thread pool right, uh, that, you know, that's an executor. Uh, but the difference is that instead of it just, uh, once it idles out, instead of it just going and, and uh, blocking wait on a, on a queue waiting for work, it's gonna go and go into an, an I.O. event loop waiting on a selector waiting for I.O. input, okay? So that's what this hot dispatch library that I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit, that's basically the core foundation of it. <clears throat> um, one of the central concepts in hot dispatch is something called a dispatch queue and there's two variations. There's one called the global dispatch queue and there's only one of these things per system. And when you queue runnables into it, uh, they basically execute concurrently. So you can think of this as your traditional uh, thread pool executor, okay? Um, then the other type of dispatch queue is a serial dispatch queue, and this one's a little more special. And you can think of it as a, a linked list where you enqueue runnables into, and when, you first, uh, when it first has some runnable in it, it's gonna enqueue, the, this serial dispatch queue is gonna enqueue itself into, one of the, into the global queue for, so it gets scheduled to be drained on one of the threads of that thread pool, okay? So the nice thing about this system is that everything uses uh, compare and swap operations, so you get nice uh, uh, weight-free, non-blocking operations everywhere. Uh, it's got less uh, overhead than, for example, if you got a highly contended object that's using uh, traditional mutexes, if you're trying to uh, access it and it's highly contended, using uh, CAS operations is gonna lower your overhead a little bit. So, <clears throat> Generally, we're gonna use these serial dispatch queues everywhere inside the uh, Apollo broker. In this little diagram, you kind of see a little bit, uh, a, a little view of 
all the parts of, of, of the broker, right? We got clients and sockets, and for each one of these little yellow boxes, it's gonna have an assigned dispatch queue, okay? A serial dispatch queue. And whenever we wanna mutate the state of any of those objects, we're basically gonna enqueue uh, a runnable to mutate the state onto that serial dispatch queue associated with that object. So we'll have one for, for connections, and we'll have one for queues, and we'll have one for the virtual hosts that are running inside of Apollo. So whenever we wanna modify it, we won't modify it directly. We'll say, hey, run this task. It's gonna modify your state, but it's gonna modify it when it's running in the context of that dispatch queue when it's being executed. So by doing that, um, we basically remove all traditional uh, threads, uh, like in, in Active MQ5, whenever we have shared state, we're gonna use the traditional mutex, we're gonna lock it, if there's contection, there's gonna be threads that are gonna be waiting and stuff like that. In Apollo, there's very little waiting that's going on when a thread is going. It's everything, it's, it, those, the threads that it does execute tends to execute without ever blocking because they'll just enqueue work on the serial dispatch queue, some other thing, and eventually when they pop out, they'll execute those things and all those queues will get drained. Um, so in general, it lowers the overhead of synchronizing on these objects. And on this thread, it's just uh, kind of an example why I think it's been working out. There's um, some benchmarks that I like to run against different brokers to, s to compare to see how we're doing and Apollo's performance. Uh, this is basically, I'm using Stomp to talk to uh, a topic, right? There's one producer, on the first column I'm looking at, okay, when there's one producer talking to one topic to one consumer, right? And that's the consumer rate that the different brokers give. Uh, the light blue one is Apollo, of course. Uh, the yellow one is Actum Q5. And pretty much the rates are very comparable uh, when there's only one thing talking to one thing. But as start, you start ratcheting up the, the contention, right? We're gonna keep, we're only gonna use one topic, but we're gonna increase the number of producers and the number of consumers attached to this one topic. Uh, Apollo starts to inch out a little bit more. And as you really ratchet it up to like 10, producers talking to 10 consumers over a single topic, uh, Apollo really starts to shine and showing that, you know, it has lower contention than, for example, the traditional active and cute model. <clears throat> so another nice benefit of this new threading model that we put into Apollo is that it has lower memory overhead. Um, so here uh, are some heap dumps that I monitored with your kit. Thank you, your kit. They're awesome. They give us some open source licenses to Apache projects. Um, here's a, a thousand producer connections, uh, five thousand consumer connections, and a thousand topics that are being used uh, while I'm taking this profile. And as you can see, there's uh, basically the memory usage on the JVM jumps up to about. Uh, almost 400 megabytes, uh, which is very low, and that's because we're not assigning a thread per connection or any of that stuff, or a thread per destination, as sometimes occurs in, in uh, Active MQ5. Um, so it, it's easy to kind of scale up the, and tune the JVMs for Apollo a little easier than, for example, Active MQ. All right, so a little secret is that Apollo, even though ActiveMQ is written in Java, a lot of Apollo was written in Scala. And um, even though it's a mixed project, we still use uh, Java for some modules. There's lots of modules that do use Scala. Um, and the main reason is because Scala is a lot more terse, especially for creating things like look like closures. Um, for example, in, um, I told you guys that we use a lot of dispatch queues inside of Apollo, right? And uh, whenever you using one of these dispatch queues, you've got to pass it a runnable of some work it needs to do uh, in the context of that queue. And that first example kind of gives you an idea of what it is you do. You create a new runnable, uh, you know, inner class there to do something. Uh, but with Scala, you can kind of reduce it down to just three lines, and it's just kind of easier to use. 
So that's mainly the reason why we use Kagala. Hopefully, with, once Java 8's out, we'll be able to get to that conciseness, and maybe we'll start porting some of the Java bits over, uh, some of the Scala bits over to Java 8. But since uh, you know, Java 8 is still a long way away, so we still want to support Java 1.6, Scala's the best thing like, right now for it. <coughs> OK. OK. So another reason why I think Apollo uh, performs better than ActiveMQ5 is because it has a per-consumer store prefetch. So let's say we have a queue with millions of entries in it, right? You've just preloaded it with tons of messages, and you didn't have any consumers attached to it. Naturally, uh, Apollo, like ActiveMQ, will do its thing, and it'll swap out all those message items to disk, because there's no point in having it in memory if there's nobody to deliver those messages to, right? Um, Apollo does the same thing. Um, the difference is that ActiveMQ5 has a single cursor that it uses to fetch uh, messages out of the store and pass it over to consumers who are interested in it. Uh, Apollo basically maintains a, a, a cursor or prefetch window per consumer. So it kind of looks like this. <coughs> Sorry for the, all the arrows, but. The idea is that each consumer is going to be looking at a different part of the queue, right? Not all of it, just a few of them. And he's only going to prefetch enough messages to fulfill what he expects that consumer is going to need for him to deliver those messages some, to him soon, right? So when that happens, and you can imagine the big red dots are messages that are in memory. And then there's uh, other entries uh, that are on disk, right? He's going to say, oh, you're going to need that message soon because it's within your prefetch window. So I'm going to ask the message store to load it. And so I ask him, hey, please you know, load this back up. I need it in the queue pretty soon. Uh, we'll send the, the messages that are in memory uh, over to the consumer. And hopefully by the time the consumer has gotten to the point where he needs the message that was previously on disk, it'll be in memory by that time, and there's no delays. Um, so, uh, per consumer prefetches work really well. Uh, the new level DB store uh, can actually uh, load messages really quickly too. And so, in cases of um, where you have a, a queue loaded up with millions and millions of messages and you had no consumers attached to it, and then you start up a consumer and start trying to stream those messages as fast as possible, these are performance graphs that you can expect. Um, I think these were 20 byte messages, uh, payloads, and uh, Apollo was able to consume messages at the rate of uh, 150,000 off of uh, uh, off that queue. Whereas, for example, Actum Q was probably doing 20,000. So it's got way fast DQ times for uh, your queues. <coughs> So another really cool thing that Apollo does to really try to optimize, especially the persistent cases, um, Apollo knows that sometimes you have consumers who can act very fast. Okay? And, sometimes, and if you've got a case where a consumer is acting very fast, there's really no reason to try to persist the message that a producer sent you. And I'm going to try to illustrate this with a couple of slides here on, on why that's the case. right? Um, so let's say we have a producer sending a message to a queue. Typically what happens is the message gets sent to the message store and he's going to tell them, hey, I need you to store this message, right? And then at the same time he's going to say, hey, I can send this to the consumer anyways, right? It's no big deal, you know what I'm saying? Uh, at, the, at this point the producer still hasn't gotten an act back. So the producer doesn't know if the, the, mess, the broker has actually received the message or not. He's going to assume he hasn't. Like, for example, if the broker dies or whatever, he'll just re-deliver the message. No big deal, right? Now, <clears throat> oh yeah. So if the queue thinks that um, that consumer is kind of slow, he's not going to act me very fast. So the Apollo's queues are tracking the act rates of all the consumers to try to figure out if they're fast consumers or not. 
And if he sees he's kind of a slow consumer, he's not going to act very fast. He'll basically tell the message store, hey, flush this out to disk as soon as possible so that I can tell the producer as soon as possible that, hey, I got your message. I'm not going to lose it. So that will happen. Then actually, the message store will actually flush that message out to disk. And that basically is going to produce an act back to the producer. And now the producer says, oh, cool. Now I can forget about this message. I know you got it. It's in your hands, right? Eventually, the consumer will act back to, to the queue that, hey, I got your message. And that act will, in turn, turn into a remove operation against the message store to delete the operation off the disk. That will go straight to disk, remove the, the message off disk. And that's the general pattern that happens. In Active MQ5, that's pretty much the pattern that occurs almost every time. OK? But in the case where a consumer is acting really fast, right? He, maybe he, he's got a low latency operation of what he's doing. He's just twiddling some bits of memory. And then he acts right, right away. Let's rewind it back a few slides. We're here where we send the message to the consumer, and we send it to the message store. But this time, the key is going to say, hey, this consumer was really fast. I'm not going to ask the message store to write that message to disk right away. I'm actually going to say, hey, you can delay storing that message for a little bit. So he'll do that, and the message store will kind of put the message to the side. It's still in memory. He's basically going to put it on delay, and it's like, you know what? If, uh, if I don't get a remove operation in a little bit, I'm going to flush it to disk, right? Consumer sends an act back to the queue, and that causes a remove operation to get sent to the store. And the store just says, hey, I'm going to delete this thing out of memory, right? We never touch the disk. And of course, when you're talking about really fast uh, throughput systems, a lot of times your disk is your bottleneck, right? Because your networks are faster than the bandwidth that your disk doesn't support um, in, in some scenarios. <sighs> And we kind of optimize that whole disk persistence bit out. And at that point, we'll send the act back to the producer. So in, in this case, what actually happened is the producer blocked an act from the consumer all the way instead of w waiting for the act that it got to disk. So we basically take two paths depending on what the queue thinks the, the act rates of the consumer are. So that's one of the cool things we do with Apollo. OK. All right, so another thing is that ActMQ has this concept called virtual destinations. Um, and it's kind of basically there to make up for some of the shortcomings of uh, our implementation of the JMS specification. Uh, basically, JMS specification says there can only be one durable subscription, one consumer on a durable subscription. Right? So a durable subscription, like I told you, is kind of like a queue they can attach to a topic. But sometimes you kind of want to use that durable subscription like it is a queue, right? You want to attach multiple consumers on it and basically uh, uh, load balance the work that's on the queue across those consumers and consume it, consume it concurrently. But uh, the JMS spec basically was written in a way where we implemented durable subscriptions in ActiveMQ so that we only track uh, the last act position for that durable subscription. So you could have a 10 durable subscription on a topic, and we don't really maintain a queue of work items for that durable subscription. We just track the position of where we are in that topic that uh, that durable subscription is act up to. So that's the way it's implemented in ActiveMQ5. But if you did want to use it in a way that's kind of low balancing, we have this thing called virtual destinations, where you're sending to a topic but the virtual destination will basically send a copy of that message, that topic, to a regular queue. And then you're, you can just use queue, uh, queue sus regular queue subscribers to do the low balancing work type work, right? Well, when Apollo can kind of forget about that because the way we implement durable subscriptions is we actually do use queues to implement durable subscriptions. And you can uh, subscribe to a durable subscription with queue semantics. You can have multiple consumers against this durable subscription. You can browse a durable subscription. You can do all that kind of stuff. And then the other thing is that you can set up a queue to mirror every message that comes into it to a topic of the same name. And that's what we call the mirrored queue. So uh, if you configure a queue to be mirrored, it's basically, you know, if it's called foo, you know, queue foo, uh, it's going to, whenever it receives a message, it'll basically replay that same message to a topic called foo. And off of that topic, then you can do stuff like attach rule subscriptions and stuff like that, too. So you know, once you combine some of those things, you really don't need the, the concept of uh, virtual destinations that ActiveMQ5 introduces. 
<clears throat> All right, so let me just uh, give you an idea of uh, Paul's trajectory. Um, basically, we've pretty much implemented most of the core features in ActiveMQ5, like message groups and things like that. But we, the big things that we need to really add to it is uh, network or broker support, so that way you can run clusters of Apollos together and then all store and forward automatically between them based on where the consumers are attaching to. That's a huge feature of ActiveMQ, um, and we really need to implement it before we could ever say this is going to be ActiveMQ6. Hopefully we can implement it better in a way that scales better than the way ActiveMQ5 scales it out. Uh, we need to add uh, priority support and scheduling support. The scheduling is probably going to be easy because we already support uh, message expiration. And with message expiration, the way it's implemented in Apollo, we could probably piggyback and do uh, message scheduling too. So um, the other thing is we need to add XA transactions. And maybe we should add a JMX management API just to be compatible with it. Um, so, but like I said, we've backported a lot of features. We backported uh, from, from Apollo into ActiveMQ. We backported the level DB store, uh, which is super fast. You should do it. It's not the default store yet, just because uh, the current uh, KahaDB has kind of been battle tested, and we don't want to destabilize folks. Um, but I definitely recommend if you guys have high performance, uh, persistent requirements, try the level DB store on ActiveMQ 5.8. Um, we've also backported the MQTT protocol, which was in Apollo first, then we ported that to. Uh, ActiveMQ 5.8 and uh, other stuff. So this is how the releases have looked for Apollo. We've been pretty good about doing a couple releases a year, like five or six of them, where uh, version 1.6 was just released. It's got an awesome looking little web console that if I got time, I'm going to demo. Uh, oh, let's not do the questions yet. Let me quickly show you. Uh, what kind of Apollo looks like when it's running. Um, so uh, you start it up by just running it. Uh, it should start up pretty quickly. There you go. He opens up a bunch of ports. He tells you what he's listening on. He's listening on TCP, SSL, WebSockets, secure WebSockets. It's got some administration ports. You can look at what's going on. I'm going to switch over here real quick and, and try to put some load on it so that way the, if I look at it with an admin console, it kind of has something to show. All right, so here I'm just re uh, running some uh, producers and consumers on topics and queues. And uh, let me connect to the admin console. So this admin console is new for Apollo 1.6. It's all REST-based. Uh, using the REST APIs. With it, you can see uh, the virtual hosts that are uh, created. There's only one in this system here. But in a virtual host, uh, there's a, a store that's assigned to each virtual host. Each virtual host could be storing this data in a different area. Um, but you can look at the queues that, are, that exist in it, the topics, um, the durable subscriptions. You can do things that, like delete the durable subscriptions so you can manage it all. Um, you can, should be able to drill into the queues. There we go. We're drilling into the queues. We can look at uh, the current queue size, uh, when the last NQ occurred, right? Uh, let's see. You can look at the current messages on the queue, uh, the body, look at the headers of the message. This was the stop message that was sent to the queue. Um, doesn't expire. Uh, you can see who's uh, currently we sent it to. So uh, basically, this message was sent to a connection, and then that hadn't been received back. Uh, you can see the size of the whole message in memory. Um, you can take a look to see who's currently producing to it, uh, how many messages they've sent, total number of bytes they've sent so far, the consumers. Uh, you can look at the act rates of the consumers. So you, you, there's definitely lots more detail here than. Um, you typically can see with an active MQ5 uh, broker. On the left here, you can see some general Q statistics of what's going on, if messages have been expiring, if they have been knacked, uh, you know, if messages are being swapped out of memory or back in, you can see how many of them are currently be swapped, what is totally swapped out. So there's uh, definitely a lot of detail here. 
and I think the next thing I just want to show you is a quick example of stomp and uh, basically stomp over voice sockets. It's always a cool example just because you can use a web, br web browser. Um, here's a, a little example we shipped in the, in the distribution directory. There's an examples directory and in it you'll, you'll find a little HTML file which uses uh, web sockets. Here I got, just got to load it up. I'm going to tell it to connect to my uh, broker that's running here locally on my laptop. And uh, it's going to be um, publishing messages and receiving them uh, off of this topic here, uh, chat general. When you connect on the right side, you'll see uh, basically all the raw data that's being sent over the web socket. And this is the protocol. As you can see, it's very readable. First thing we do is send it a connect frame. The server responds back, hey, we're connected, and this is who, you, who I am. I'm, I'm on a Apache Apollo 1.6 server. Um, some heart beating is negotiated. Uh, and right here you can see the heart beating already occurring. They're pinging and pogging each other so that we can do early detection of uh, uh, connection failures. Uh, and you can send a message. Okay, so, but nobody else was in the room. This is kind of bad chat example if, uh, if I don't open up a new tab so we can receive the messages, right? Are we not connecting? No, let's not do that. Is my server down? No. Of course, something always goes wrong when you're doing a, a demo. Sick. It looks like it's trying to connect, but it's not. I don't know, maybe it's a network thing. I'm not sure what's going on. But uh, hopefully it'll work for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Apollo 1.6 is out. Give it a shot. Um, you might like it better than ActiveMQ 5 for, you know, simple projects. You know, your bigger, larger scale projects, I still recommend you use ActiveMQ 5 just because it's got stuff like uh, uh, networks of brokers and things like that. And uh, let me open it up for questions. Any questions out there? Uh, yes, you mentioned uh, the local EV seems like it's pretty much ready for prime time. And can I start using that in 57 or 58 production? Do you recommend that? I do. In 58 for sure. Okay. Do it. If there's anything wrong with it, we'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the only reason it's not default yet is uh, basically because we want to make sure we port all, every single test that we have over to it and we haven't had time to it. I think we've ported probably 75% uh, of all our unit tests over to uh, level DB so they also run. Uh, but our intent is probably next version, uh, next minor version of ActiveMQ, we're probably going to make level DB the default store. It hadn't been before uh, and we really couldn't recommend it because it hadn't implemented uh, XA support. But now it has XA support, um, so it's totally feature complete. It also handles the non-persistent case too, um, so you can kind of rip out all the CalHDB bits if you want to. Any other questions? Yes. The message browser in the console. You guys have a computer to turn that off. The message browser in the console. So being able to look at the message uh, is one of our issues. With so, yeah, so one of the things you can do with, uh, with Apollo is um, there's uh, access rules they can configure, okay? And one of the access rules is uh, who can uh, uh, view messages off a topic or a queue. All right, and that even applies into the admin console. The admin console is using the same security mechanism as if you were a regular client. 
Five eight, yeah. Five eight. The it's using like it's like super admin if you're using console. All the REST APIs they're using the same security bits as um, everything else. Uh, for example, if you don't, if you can't even uh, see a queue, if you don't have any access to a queue, when you're an admin, it won't even show up as a list uh, on the list of queues you can see. Like it's like filtered out because you have no access to the queue or any of that. Um, yeah. So. There's also a very, uh, well, I would say it's a decent uh, REST API. Uh, they can see right here, down here at the very bottom of the console, there's like a REST API link. And uh, you can basically look at all the URLs that you can access to, um, you know, do things like browse queues somewhere around here. Oh, here's topics. Do things for topics. You can browse all the topics get uh, durable sub metrics. So this is a metrics as a roll up of all the durable subs. You could look at a single durable subs, but you can also say, hey, uh, aggregate all the durable subscription metrics and see what's going on. Let's see, will this work? Oh yeah, look, it worked. So here you can basically see what's going on with total name queues, uh, basically the current time of the server, just in case you wanna avoid skews, time skews and stuff like that, um, you know, <clears throat> the number of uh, durable subs you're looking at is this objects thing. So it's got a, it's got a decent uh, REST API. It's kind of autom uh, automatically documented using um, this screen here. Uh, so, any other questions? Yeah. Yep. So no. So like right now, we're using we test a uh, active Q five X. Uh, I think five seven. Maybe we just upgraded to the five eight clients. But we basically use active Q's clients to test connecting to Apollo. So we're using those old clients and protocol versions. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, and and when if we, if we ever make this uh, this broker be the active Q6, um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to jettison the old server code but maintain all the client bits. And already uh, active Q58, we changed the the way the jars are packaged and you know the organization to in the future be able to kind of do that if we want to. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you.